Good morning, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Indeed, I, I'd love to speak with you to, today about the question how we can change the actual the operating system of businesses and the economy. Because somehow, you know, you, you probably also sometimes have this feeling, you know, we hear, we hear about climate crisis, we hear about global corporations that are so powerful that even states can't really regulate them, they evade their taxes, they go to Cayman Islands. We somehow have the feelings, you know, we need more rules. We need to somehow get these psychopathic companies into cages and make sure they, you know, they don't behave uh, bad. And I would like to ask the question, is that actually this, this approach that we've taken as a global regulatory society, is that actually the right approach? Can we tame animals that are actually, like in their DNA, built to do something that we don't want? Is it actually possible um, to, to build more and more regulatory um, cages around these companies? Or do we actually maybe um, have to ask the question whether it's possible to change the DNA of the company itself, to change the operating system of the company, the core of the company, and what is the core of the company? What's the core of capitalism itself? It's ownership. It's private ownership. And so that's what I would love to talk with you about. And to start with that, I have to make a confession. I am a capitalist myself. I'm an owner. Uh, I started my first uh, business when I was 16, when all my friends had girlfriends. Uh, I fell in love with my company. And, um, you know, it's, it's so, it's, I, I, I think there are many owners amongst you, so you know that. It's so great, you know, to, to be owner of a company. You, you, you can identify 100% with it. And this, this private ownership really empowers you. We heard the, the, the power thing. It, it empowers you. You have an idea at night. You can realize it the next day. You can shape the environment you live in. You know, you're not dependent on the state or whatever. So it's, it's, it's like, actually, you know, you feel really responsible for it. You identify with it. Like having a child. You know, you, if, the, if your company or your ch ch uh, child is ill or, you know, needs something, you have to be there. There's nobody else, you know. You are responsible. And that's the great thing about private ownership, why Aristotle and many others are so much in favor um, of private ownership. There's not... Everybody responsible for it, not, not nobody, but you. There's a clear definition who is responsible, and that's what I love so much, to be honest, of private ownership, and I don't want to abolish it. It's kind of very strong identification. However, it also became clear to me, and I think it's, it's very, very clear today, there's a problem. We, we definitely have a problem at the moment, and the question is, you know, what, how, can we, how can we change it without... Um, without throwing away also the benefits um, of ownership. And for me, um, it really became apparent what the problem with ownership is when I um, visited the hospital of my father. My father um, managed a hospital for, for many years. Um, and it was always, you know, I, I came there as a young, um, as a young child very often, uh, and I really enjoyed it there. Very warm atmosphere, very nice, you know, very kind employees, um, the patients were all very, very nice, organic food, it's uh, very good. Until one day, and I, I, I wondered what happened, and the, the, the thing was, the, the hospital was sold once, twice, eventually three times to a big public stock market company. And each investor had to pay a higher price for the hospital, like paying a higher price for the houses that you buy. And so each time, a higher price, and what happened? They, each time they increased the pressure on my father and the hospital to increase, to increase the profits in order to pay back the high price they paid. So they forced my father to outsource the kitchen to a low quality provider. They forced him to fire half of the doctors and, to cut the, and they cut the time allowed to spend um, with patients. So suddenly you had unhappy employees, unhappy patients, and this hospital was part of a big, a big global gigantic corporation that manages 70,000 hospital beds over, all over the globe. And decisions were now taken 
2,000 kilometers away in Paris in a headquarter by people who have literally never been to the hospital. They don't know what is needed there. You know? they, they don't know what it means when they order from 2,000 kilometers away to cut, for example, uh, to no, when they order doctors to spend no more than five minutes for a first conversation with patients. You know, these guys in Paris, they, um, they just know one thing, they have to produce better numbers, otherwise they are fired. And, what, and I, I try to find out who these guys are and I try to meet them because it really drove me crazy when I was young what happened there with the hospital. And what drew, drove me even more crazy, I met them and you know what? They're good people. They have, they, they, they have organic food in their fridge. You know, it's, it's not, they're not, they're, they don't try to ruin the world. They are driven by others, by anonymous shareholders, by anonymous stock markets, or to be more precise, by algorithms and high-frequency uh, trading computers that we, have, um, that we have in the meantime invented that do 99% of the stock market trading today and that sell, and, uh, that sell ownership in nanoseconds. And so these people cannot feel responsible for the company like a parent. They control the company, but they're not connected to it. You know, these people are, they are not real owners, I would say. I would, I would actually claim the kind of stock market economy that we have today abolishes the, the real ownership. It's not owning and it, you, cannot, you know, cannot say they are owning it. They're just controlling it. So actually, what we've done there is is abolishing ownership itself and all the benefits. And now the interesting thing is if you go and, you know, I, I wasn't satisfied with these guys who said, well, you know, Armin, sorry, we have to do that, otherwise we're fired and I cannot pay, um, uh, pay for the rent. Um, I said, okay, but who's, who is, who's doing that to you? Well, you know, markets, funds, etc. cetera. And who is in the, who's investor in the funds? And then you can ask and ask and, and in the end, you, maybe you come to a fund manager who says, well, I have to invest only this way, otherwise I'm fired. And then you, and then you ask yourself, who, who are all the investors? And the interesting thing is, here, that's the graphic that I found, where investment capital on the stock market lives. It's 87% of all the money on the stock markets is, and that's a scandal, and it's really a scandal, that's you and me. That's all of us. That's pension funds and insurance companies. It's not the rich, it's not the super rich. Yes, they also have 4% on the stock markets, but it is us Western half rich. You know, we are also compared um, on, the, on the global level, we are also all uh, belonging to the richest 10% of the world. And we are the ones that own the companies. We have created a system that takes our money and uses it against us. That's the scandal and you know, when, <laughs> when when I, when I realized this, this, this really the scales from, uh, fail, uh, fell from my eyes, I realized you can, ownership somehow has, has a double face, you know? Ownership, the legal invention, this cultural technology that we as humanity invented 2,000 years ago, ownership, ownership can create really strong responsibility. But at the same time, it can destroy responsibility. It can create something which I would call absentee ownership. Or maybe you, it's not even worth to call it ownership. Maybe it's just absentee control. That's the, it's the same technology that, that somehow creates this responsibility and destroys it. And so for me, really, the question was, for my company, but also in general, how can we heal the idea of ownership, of, of, of responsibility, of empowerment? And um, the good news is there are a lot of very interesting companies out there that have found ways to heal ownership. And one of the guys who found a way is actually this guy, it's um, Ernst Abbe. He was uh, the co-owner of Zeiss. Zeiss is a big German company, um, 70,000 employees. And he lived 130 years ago. They uh, invented the microscope and today, you know, no smartphone or tablet could be produced without Zeiss laser and optic technologies. So it's, um, yeah, they're a world market leader in their field. And this guy, he was a professor um, and he invented a microscope and he was actually also co-owner. He had all reasons to say, well, this is my company, you know, and it's my success. 
without my invention, the company wouldn't be that successful. But he said, actually, you know, is this actually my success? It somehow feels wrong. You know, yes, I invented the microscope, but there were generations of other researchers and scientists before me who have built a lot of um, research on which I could build up and then do this, um, this invention that was a breakthrough, uh, breakthrough for Zeiss. And also all the employees all in this society did that actually built this company. Am I, the law gives me the absolute right to own everything, to take everything, but is that actually right? No, he said, that doesn't feel right. Somehow I need a other ownership structure. I need to make sure that the company is, is somehow self-owned or owned by the ones that are actually active there. And so what he um, back then chose um, as a, and it was an innovative thing, he didn't know how to, how to decommodify his company. He didn't know how to, to uh, make the company or structure it in a way that it wouldn't get absentee owners, but real identifying stewards who felt stewardship for the company. He didn't know that, um, that there were no legal forms for this. But the good thing was, because he was an inventor, he also invented something there. He used the legal form of a foundation and donated the entire company to this foundation. That was the first foundation on company uh, in Germany and was uh, enormously successful, survived several political system, systems. And if you ask the employees there, and I visited them a lot, they're saying, well, you know, it's our company. We know we're working here not for the private pocket of somebody else, but actually for the purpose of the company. And we know the assets of the company are locked. They cannot be taken out. The company is decommodified. And, um, and we know the control of the company, the steering wheel, is always with people who identify with the company, with, with stewards. Now, I did a little research on whether there are other companies around in the world that are similarly structured. And I found quite a lot, and one is probably known here in the UK. It's John Lewis. You also have Mozilla Firefox, and you have many others. They're big automotive suppliers like Bosch and Mahle. They're structured like this, and all in a very different way. You, obviously, you know um, John Lewis more under the term employee ownership, and that's true. And at the same time, um, it's different than usual employee ownership, because all of these companies are in their DNA, in their structure, they are making sure that two principles are really met. And I, I walk you through these principles. One is self-governance. So they're making sure the majority of the steering wheel, or the, the majority of the voting rights, sorry, the steering wheel of the company, is in hands of people who are connected to the company, who are active in there, maybe. Um, this doesn't mean, like, in, you know, in the case of John Lewis, that means all 70,000 people uh, or employees um, are partners. Um, in other cases, it's not uh, all the employees. Um, but it's very clear, you can only be connected to the steering wheel of the company, to the governance, if you are connected to the company. You cannot sell it like, like a pair of shoes, as you can with stock market companies. So that's the one principle that they all um, adhere to. And the second principle is what I would call the purpose principle, or more technically, an asset lock. They're all locking the assets and saying, yes, there will be some profits distributed maybe you know, to investors or employees, but the wealth of the company itself, the assets, cannot be privatized. They're locked. They are there for the purpose of the company. Why? Because, well, the company itself exists only for a purpose, to create certain value for the society. It, it's not an instrument anymore for absentee owners who use it as an instrument to generate more wealth. No, the company itself is as a group of com uh, people working together for a purpose, and obviously that means that, we, that the owners are not wealth owners, but steward owners, stewards, who are stewarding the company. And so also in the case of John Lewis, you know that if you're not working there anymore, you have to give back um, your, your voting rights, because only those that are active, the stewards, are uh, actually holding it, and the asset lock makes sure um, the stewards cannot just you know, one day decide, well, actually, let's just sell the company. Like, um, you know, that happens a lot with employee-owned companies in, in the U.S. Um, that in the U.S., you know, every year a lot of employee companies uh, are generated, but the number of total employee-owned companies in the U.S. is not growing. Why? Because every year the same number of employee-owned companies are sold again because one generation of employees says, well, we don't feel as stewards anymore. We're not stewards. We're wealth owner. Let's just sell this stuff and we become all millionaires. Great, you know? So that's... That's what happens when you just 
when you just try to realize the first principle, self-governance, just give it to everybody, without the second principle, decommodification of the company. If you don't use, if you don't decommodify, if you don't put an asset lock in place, you're just replacing the, I would say, you know, an absentee owner-driven capitalism with a capitalism that's driven by a herd of employees who see the company as an instrument to generate more profit for themselves. So th that's why these two principles are so important, and that's what I would propose and what we propose to, to um, name steward ownership, because you're a steward. Or Colin Meyer from Oxford, he says it's, it's trustee ownership, because you're a trustee. Maybe that's, um, in the UK, a better word for that. Now, is it actually, well, wh wh what is trustee ownership? It's, I would say it's breaking with, um, with two old cultural technologies that we have um, that usually decide who governs the company. Like the, the, the typical cultural technology um, this, that decides who, who gets the company is, of course, money. You know, if you have seven uh, billion on your account at the moment, it's very cheap to buy the Deutsche Bank. Um, they're, they're quite cheap on the stock markets. You can buy the majority and you can do whatever you want with it. You can create a green bank out of it because the control is, is buyable by the highest bidder. Very easy cultural technology how to allocate ownership and uh, how to allocate power. So it's a power um, allocation mechanism that we have in, in capitalism, money equals power. Very simple. And the other mechanism is also known to all of us, of course, it's inheritance. You know, if you are happy enough to be born as a son or daughter of um, an entrepreneur, well, you can just, then blood is the other one, or as Warren Buffett puts it, the lottery of sperms decides who is actually um, getting the power. Now, steward ownership is breaking with both of these principles. And both principles might have a certain justification, and there are definitely companies then that can work or that, can, that are successful also with the other principles. So the principle of blood is, of course, the family-owned companies. Family-owned companies are, have used the allocation mechanism of genetic, um, genetic uh, relation or blood um, to ensure uh, that always a next owner is, is selected. And the other ones are, of course, the companies that are bought and sold. And with steward ownership, we replace this cultural technology actually with ability, value alignment, as w and with involvement uh, in the company. So it's just a new principle that replaces blood and money. And uh, I have to tell you, I studied uh, in New York, um, and I studied these kinds of uh, companies, and my professors uh, said, well, I mean, you know, it's very nice that you are studying this romantic European uh, ideas, uh, but this cannot work, you know? This, this cannot work. Why? Very easy, very easy. Because what are you doing? You are decoupling what always needs to be together in capitalism. You are decoupling money and power. You are saying there are people who are steering a company who are not at the same time holding the wealth of the company. Why should somebody wake up, get up in the morning, and uh, work for a company if he or she is not doing that for his own wealth. All these, like Bosch, for example, which is structured like this. These guys from Bosch will, you know, you'll see they die very fast, and, and it, it, you'll see that. The funny thing is um, the reality proves them wrong because, as you know, the average, uh, the average lifespan of an S&P 500 company is 17 years, and Bosch is 130 years, and in 130 years history, they had how many CEOs? Seven. Um, and if you look at, and the good thing is in Denmark, we have more than 1,000 companies that are steward-owned because they have a better law, and uh, we have very nice studies on them. For example, this one that shows, you know, this, the red line is a uh, normal-owned company, the blue line is foundation-owned or steward-owned companies. Here you see the firm age and the survival probability. And you see, after 40 years, the steward-owned companies have a six times higher survival probability. Why? Because the steering wheel is in the hands of people who are not interested in short-term profits. They, they cannot extract the wealth for themselves. They're steward owners. You know, they're interested in the mission of the company itself. Otherwise, they would go away. That's a good selection mechanism. You know, only if you're intrinsically motivated, you will stay because that's the only motor that still drives you. So that's, um, and there are many other nice studies which I cannot cite 
um, today because it's, uh, it's too much. Uh, employees stay longer and uh, um, also managers stay longer there and they get more money and whatever. And very important, divorce rates is lower if you work in this company. So if you, <laughs> if, if you want a long-term marriage, you know, work in a steward-owned company. That would be my advice. Um, now, I see my time is um, almost up, so unfortunately, I cannot go into details how you can do that today, um, also without setting up very complicated foundations, because we, I wanted to do this, of course, myself, and the, the, the problematic thing is all our legal forms, like, you know, the limited company, they were invented 130 years, 150 years ago, uh, in, a, in an environment where people started companies in order to get rich, very simple. And if you now want a steward on company and you use this legal form, it somehow makes you wealth owner if you want it or not. And by the way, also with a co-op, you can, the co-op doesn't have an asset lock, but you can change the co-op, the limited company and others with a very simple hack. And maybe you allow me to quickly um, at least uh, give you a glimpse into the hack and the rest I will tell in the workshop I'll give later. Um, what I did with my company is I said, okay, you know, I create a share class, which I call the steward shares. They have 99% of the voting rights. They control, control the entire company, but they do, do not have dividend rights. They do not have the right to extract assets from the company. And I said to my employees and my colleagues, well, you know, this is how we promise that the company is actually steward owned. And now, in order to make sure that we as stewards owners cannot just wake up one morning and say, well, actually, you know, the company is so much uh, worth, we want to sell it, uh, we, uh, uh, we want to commodify the company again, we said, okay, we need a hack, we need somehow a way to promise to the entire world that this company will uh, be a steward-owned company and we cannot just, you know, one day change the charter again and make it... Um, a normal company, and that's why we said, okay, we need, we just write these principles of steward ownership into the charter, and we say these principles can only be changed with a 100% majority, and 1% we give into a foundation. We started a foundation for that purpose foundation that has, not, that has just one goal, to veto any attempt um, <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to commodify the company again. So in the charter of the foundation, that's the, that's the goal. And now this foundation has dozens of veto rights all over the world. Uh, also in the UK, by the way, we have companies that are using this model um, in the US, in Netherlands, in Germany, in Finland, and so on. And all these companies send representatives to the board of the foundation. So in the end, what this is, is nothing then. We call it a layer in our own jurisdiction. It's our semi-state, um, because the state doesn't offer a legal form of steward ownership yet. We create our own one, and we are all citizens of the Purpose Foundation state. And we, if really something changes, um, like blockchain will rule the world, and we don't need legal forms anymore, we can um, govern uh, in the in the govern uh, in the governance of the foundation. The entrepreneurs um, in consensus can change it. Uh, by the way, investors can also invest in these companies. How that is done, you can see um, in the workshop. Or, oh, these are example companies. We cannot go through this. So Purpose. Um, what I wanted to say is here. You can download a book of 120, 120 pages for free um, around steward ownership, how to do it with your own company, how to take investment in, what kind of tools of in investment are still possible, how do you convince a VC to invest in such a company, um, that what other examples of companies uh, are there, what kind of other models besides what we call the golden share model, what kind of other models, trust model, um, or purpose trust model, or foundation models, and other models are out there. That's all in the book. You can download it for free. I have uh, three printed copies with me, first come, first serve. And, um, and otherwise, maybe I can just tell you that um, it is what really makes me positive is that there are so many entrepreneurs out there that are saying we start a company not in order to get rich primarily, but to change the world. Um, with Purpose, we started to help these uh, companies. We built an infrastructure for steward-owned companies. Uh, we, we do a lot of like, nonprofit work to like, write these books. We have this golden share service or video share service. We do a lot of consulting. And we have raised uh, two investment funds that manage in total 50 million uh, euro. And the, 
which is only and primarily invested in steward-owned businesses, um, startups and also larger companies that are saying, we want to become steward-owned, but one of our investors is blocking it. Can you buy him out or can we somehow manage something there? That's what we can do with our funds. But also in the startup sector, we are um, helping a lot of uh, very interesting um, startups. And, uh, uh, and <laughs> when we're... And the <laughs> yeah, and that the events that we're running now are, that's just wh why I'm so positive about it now. You know, we started an event um, in, uh, in Germany, in Berlin. We said, why are self-owned companies needed to unfuck the economy? And um, we thought maybe 90 people will register, and we had 1,200 people registering. And we just did it again and again. And now uh, the next one is end of November. And after five days, it was, uh, we had already 1,500 people um, registered for the event, so we see there is a there is a big need or a big movement for that, and um, and it's so inspiring to see when these entrepreneurs who could earn millions um, by just selling their companies um, are deciding no, I'm not doing this. Like you know, an entrepreneur with a big search engine in Germany, 10 million users, that uh, search engine that plant, plants trees, Ecosia, he could sell it for 100 million, he said, no, I make it steward-owned with the golden share model. And the moment he did it, you know, you can look into the eyes of all the stakeholders of the employees, what that makes. If a person who could every single second uh, put a signature um, below a treaty and then um, they would, he would have 100 million on a bank account, if such a person says, I'll not, I'll do, I, I put one signature um, below a treaty that will forever prevent me to do that again. This company is cell phones, not my private asset anymore. That has such a magical force because suddenly we all know we're actually working for a purpose. It's not just the Apple recruiting video saying, come here, change the world, um, and we know we're actually working for shareholders. No, here we're actually working for a purpose. And in a world in which 80% every year again and again in the Gallup um, polls are saying 80% of people, we, we either, we we work only nine to, f nine to um, five without emotional attachment or we have internally quit already, 80%, you know? So many people that get ill, I would say, because we live in an economy because they spend most time of their lives in an economy without emotional attachment, without purpose. That's, I think, a clear signal where we see, okay, if we change that, if we can change, if we can really bring purpose into the lives of all these um, people then, we can uh, actually change society, have a healthier society, and also an economy that runs on a different operating system. Thank you very much. Thank you.